Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Grim Dark History Podcast, where we explore the intersection between history and popular fiction. I'm your host, Jeremy Agnew, and what we do on this show, if this is your first time tuning in, is explore the history that popular fiction pulls into its own lore. You may have been reading a book, watching a TV show, maybe playing a video game, watching a movie, whatever that is, that set itself in a historical time or place. And you may have asked the question, was it really like that? How much of that was real versus them taking artistic license to tell an entertaining story to you? That's what this is about. We want to get into the deep dive, the nitty gritty details of all these parts and places that are pulled into popular fiction. If this is your first time tuning in, you may want to go back to episode one in this series where we explored the kind of broader context of the culture, people, and place of Judea around 160 BCE, which is right around the time of the period commonly known as the Maccabee Revolt. And why we're covering this, you may be asking, Maccabee Revolt, that's not in any popular fiction I know about. But it is set in a lot of time periods, the period following the Maccabee Revolt, which is the time period of early Christianity, Jesus of Nazareth, that type of thing. And this is the kind of historical place we're studying. In order to get at that place, understanding that, we had to understand what was going on in the Maccabee Revolt in order to even understand what was happening in the time of Jesus of Nazareth. So episode one was an interview with historian and professor of ancient history Boris Krubasek as we discussed the area of Jerusalem and Judea and understood the people, the place, the context, what was going on in the culture leading up to the Maccabee Revolt. This episode is going to be covering the Maccabee Revolt and the Hasmonean Dynasty, the Maccabee Dynasty, up until the time of Herod the Great and early Roman intervention and rule of Judea. Now, what we're going to be drawing heavily from in this series is a couple of books. These are my primary sources. Those would be The Antiquity of the Jews and the Wars of the Jews by Roman Jewish historian Flavius Josephus. And I think it's important to point out what we talked about in episode one in this series. We were talking about the Book of the Maccabees, books one and two, which is literally history that's been written by the victors. And it's important to note that Flavius Josephus's Wars of the Jews is also history written by the victors. So we have to take things that are said in here under, uh, you know, with a certain grain of salt. And I'm going to be discussing that in great detail in the third episode in this series when we dig into the Roman and, or pardon me, the aftermath of Jesus of Nazareth, pardon me, Jesus of Nazareth. One generation later is the time period where Flavius Josephus lived and he took part in the Jewish Roman revolt, the first Jewish Roman revolt, which led to the destruction of Jerusalem. Before we get started today, I thought it would be a good place to just set the stage on the larger world of the Mediterranean. We're going to be starting our story around 170, 175 before Common Era. And if you were with me on our last episode, of course, we were talking about the world of Judea and 
and uh, the surrounding lands in Jerusalem around 160 BCE and kind of what was the immediate world like after or during kind of the height of the Maccabee revolt. The world of the Mediterranean around 180 BCE is um, the Seleucids are a major but weakening power. Rome is an ascendant power. Rome has just kind of wrapped up the third and final Punic War against Carthage. Rome is an ascendant power in amongst the Mediterranean, expanding their influence through the late kind of mid-Roman Republic era. Caesar and Pompey and the Triumvirate are still a ways away. The slave revolt of Spartacus that a lot of us are familiar with from popular culture is still a ways away, still distant into the future. However, Rome is a dominant controlling force and expanding into northern Italy. They're expanding into the areas that were previously controlled by Carthage. They are expanding into um, Greece and Anatolia. And they have just concluded a war against the Seleucids. This was formally ended in the Treaty of Apamea, which forced the Seleucids to abandon roughly half of Anatolia and whatever possessions and influence they had in Greece to the Romans. It also forced the Seleucids to give up a royal hostage, which was in fact the heir to the Seleucid throne. This allowed Antiochus IV, who shouldn't necessarily have been king of the Seleucid Empire, to seize control and become the king of the Seleucid Empire. Now, Antiochus, not able through the terms of the treaty, to expand his empire in, Auto in Anatolia and retake the lands he, succeed, pardon me, he ceded to Rome. He instead rebuilds the army and attacks the Ptolemies in Egypt. And he's successful in taking several lands, Judea being one of them, the city of Jerusalem and the lands south of that. But he is defeated by the Ptolemies kind of at the tipping point in a critical battle. And so Antiochus, and this is Antiochus IV, who's become ruler of the Seleucid Empire just a few years after this Treaty of Apamea has been signed with Rome. He is now the king of former lands that he's controlled, looking at lands in Anatolia that his uh, former brother, who was the former ruler of the Seleucid Empire, lost short on cash, and what do you do if you're a ruler who's short on cash, wanting to build armies, your, your nation's kind of built on battle, this is your identity, you're really, from the lands that you have conquered, you want taxes, you want to be able to raise armies, slaves, you want... Um, the produce and goods produced in these lands. And Antiochus is getting all of this. But he's not getting what he should be getting out of Jerusalem and Judea, the surrounding lands that are surrounding Jerusalem. And we talked a lot in the last episode about why Antiochus is not getting 
what he needs out of Judea and Jerusalem and those lands there. And if you're wondering what that is, you can go back and listen to the previous episode because we spent an awful lot of time trying to understand what is happening in Judea. But I'm going to summarize it for you now. But if you're interested, you can go back to my first episode in the series where I have an interview with historian and ancient history professor Dr. Boris Krubasik discussing this time period. But the land of Jerusalem and Judea is in a middle of what we could almost describe as civil war. And I say it's almost civil war because it is not outright there are armies marching back and forth trying to conquer each other. But there is violence happening in fits and spurts in and amongst Jerusalem and the countryside immediately surrounding the city of Jerusalem. This is taking the form of cultural shocks and rejection over what's been happening, over what it means to be Jewish and what it even means to be Judean. There's groups of Judeans who do not like the influences of the Greek world of the Seleucids. And it's not even necessarily the Seleucids specifically because they were previously under the Ptolemies, who were also Greek-influenced dynasties. There are portions of people, some of them extravagantly wealthy, who are native Judeans and even natives of the city of Jerusalem who are perfectly happy to work within the bounds of the Seleucid Empire or the Ptolemaic Empire. They're happy to collect taxes because they make a lot of money themselves. They are profiting over being part of the cogs of empire, whether it's Seleucids whether it's Ptolemaic, whatever that is. And there are Greek goods flowing into the Judean countryside. There's Greek wine, Greek silverware, Greek pottery, Greek art. Greek cultural institutions are flowing in and amongst this land over the last few hundred years. And... At some point, there has been some boiling over, some rejection of this. And and I'm trying to find, I've been racking my brain trying to find a good modern context for us to understand what's about to happen. And I, I can't think of any better analogy to what is about to happen than to expand upon the epic Star Wars analogy my guest, Dr. Boris Krubasik, made on my previous episode. Boris compared this world to the recent Star Wars series, Andor, and I think he hit the nail right on the head because in the world of Andor, this is the early empire it is just the nascent forming of the rebellion that everybody knows about that eventually leads to luke skywalker and all that sort of stuff but in the world of andor there are people happily working within the bounds of the evil quote-unquote galactic empire There are people making lots of money, being part of the empire. There are people within the ruling body of the empire, the Senate, that are happily working with it, looking to expand upon it. And there are people within that same government not at all happy with the empire. And they're looking to support rebellion looking to stoke the fires of rebellion. 
and some of them are doing it secretly. There are groups of people doing it openly. And I think that this is a interesting analogy that probably hits the nail on the head about what is happening in this world. There's rebellion happening and the empire doesn't even really realize it's happening. It's like a kind of civil war, but not civil war, rebellion, but not rebellion. It takes the form of rival groups of Jewish people. And in the city of Jerusalem are these same groups of people. And in the countryside of surrounding Jerusalem, the Judean countryside, these are these same groups of people that are not agreeing with what it means to be Jewish. And this is becoming such a significant problem that there are flashpoints that erupt and express themselves in violence. And the focus of that violence is the Greek culture of the empires which they have been under for the last eight generations or so. The Greek culture, the Greek silverware, the Greek wine, the Greek pottery, the Greek art, the Greek cultural institutions, the Greek names people are adopting, whether they're the everybody person in the countryside or part of the nobility. Names like Aristobulus, names like Alexander, Alexandra, Simon, Ptolemy. These are all names that are Greek roots in them, worming their way, becoming part of the Judean and Jewish culture. And there are groups of people rejecting this, but there are groups of people that think, this is perfectly fine. Give me more of that Greek wine. It tastes better than the crap we've got locally. I like this Greek art. It looks nice. I'm happy to have it on the wall. I like the Greek empire that I'm a part of because I'm able to move my goods around all over this countryside and I don't got to pay tithes and taxes to get stuff around. I don't have to worry about being attacked by roaming people on the countryside because the world's at peace. I don't have to worry about the Sumerians attacking me or the Edomians attacking me if I'm moving my goods around because we're all part of the same empire. There's a certain peace that enables culture to spread, business to spread, economies to grow. This is the world of empire, and even though these empires are fighting back and forth, this doesn't necessarily have a lot of big impacts on the cities or the farms. You know, in this time, empire, the battles, they fought outside in, you know, set-piece battles. One battle, you know, it was done. All out changed was who the tax man was. This is the world that's happening, and their, their rejection of this Greekness, there's growing groups that are angry about this. It would be disrupting tax gathering. It would be disrupting trade. It would be causing governors to have to spend money on soldiers and troops moving around the countryside trying to enforce the law. And so you can imagine our Seleucid overlord wanting his taxes, wanting his money, needing taxes, needing money in order to build armies in case the Romans come and get them, in case the Ptolemies come and try to take back the land that he had just got one in case the Persians start um, attacking the western borders, or pardon me, wait, attacking the eastern borders of the empire. So there's a lot of pressure in the Seleucid world to have peaceful lands, 
well collected taxes and tithes of soldiers and tithes of slaves. This is the world, and the Judean countryside is not participating this as optimally as it should be, not according to the Seleucids anyway. And so the Seleucids have to send people over here. They got to take time to say, you know, what the heck is going This is a teeny little piece of my empire. Why is it causing me so much problem? And you'd have to wonder, why would you even care if it is such a tiny piece of land? But of course, in our last episode, we've learned that since the start of what we would call the Second Temple period, when the city of Jerusalem was rebuilt under the Persian Empire, Jerusalem and the surrounding lands have been well developed, and it is becoming a powerful economy and there's a lot of tax money and goods and services and such whatnot to be had within the city of Jerusalem and the surrounding lands. And so Antiochus needs this sorted out. This is a, you know, a, a small little piece of land punching above its weight class in terms of its economy. So there's a lot of wealth to be extracted from that. Within the city of Jerusalem, the highest position of political authority is the office of high priest of Jerusalem. If you're interested in what the high priest is, what the jobs and roles and duty of the high priest is, you can go back and listen to one of my previous episodes. The first episode in the series, we spent quite a bit of time discussing the priesthood, high priest, normal priest, what's the difference, what do they do? But the high priest, it's the head of the council, the Sanhedrin, which is responsible for the political decisions within the city and within the immediate countryside of the city of Jerusalem. And it's a city. It is not a kingdom. They don't have a lot of lands that they control. It is just a city that has been part of empires for basically hundreds and hundreds of years. This position, this high priesthood position, of course, because it's the most powerful position within the city, it is obviously something that everybody who has ambition aspires to achieve. But the high priesthood isn't something that anybody can achieve. It's not even something that anybody who's of noble birth can achieve. If you are not familiar with kind of Jewish high priests and, and how that role works, it is basically a hereditary position that can only be appointed from one of two families, mostly from the family of Aaron, who is the inheritor of uh, Moses as they leave the desert. So the family of Aaron, which is a huge family, so there's a lot of potential people who could become high priest within this family. These are the people who traditionally hold the role hereditarily of becoming the high priest. And there are lots and lots of people who are you know, of Jewish descent that would see this as, this is set in stone. This, this is what it's always been. This is what it has been since basically the start of our history, since we've left the exodus behind us in Egypt and come to our new land. It has only been the family of Aaron who is the high priest. Now, this isn't necessarily something that's set in stone. This is not something that other Jewish people would believe. And so the position of high priest, which is traditionally this hereditary position of which only people who are from the lineage of Aaron can become, well, some of these people are willing to bribe Antiochus to make them high priest. And Antiochus, 
as far as we know, doesn't really understand that only people from the family of Aaron can be high priest, and he probably doesn't even care. So somebody throws some bribes his way, make me high priest, you know, to Antiochus, like I said, the high priest, it's the highest political authority. Sure, there's a religious element to being high priest, but having your own guy who owes you favors being the one who's running the city might go a long way to helping sort out this collecting taxes problem that you have. So yeah, somebody with a lot of money throws a bribe his way, will appoint a new high priest, and while that's shocking in its own right, the person he appoints is still from the family of Aaron, so that's not, you know, so crazy. Antiochus sees this more as like a governor position. Yeah, you're, you're, you're governor now. Now this is where things start going really off the rails here. And the exact order of operations here is not clear. But this is one of the main ignition points for what will become the rebellion. And Antiochus's um, appointment of Jason, who's Greek, you know, that, that's a Greek name. And I say he's Greek. He's not Greek. He is undoubtedly a native of Jerusalem, but he obviously has a Greek name. Jason, who becomes high priest, tries to abolish the hereditary theocracy that's been there and try to convert Jerusalem into a Greek polis. And if you're wondering, what the heck is a polis? What does that mean? You know, you're familiar with the concept of democracy. But in the Greek world, a polis would be more of what we would think of as an oligarchy. It would be, you know, groups of the elite of the elite, the rich people. Those would be the ones who would get together and decide who should run the world. They would kind of group, group pardon me, jointly make decisions. So this is what Jason is accused of doing. And then you can see that being a bonus to Antiochus is, you know, if, if all this religious people are, are causing these problems, let's, let's just abolish this high priesthood thing. And I don't have to do that. Somebody who's a high priest can abolish that. And then that's something, a message coming from internal to the community might be more well received. But again, Antiochus is bribed yet again to have somebody else become high priest. This is a guy by the name of Menelaus. Menelaus, it's also another Greek name, but Menelaus is not from this high priesthood family of Aaron. And this is a problem. This actually triggers riots within the city and probably within the countryside. And Antiochus has to now send people into the countryside to sort this thing out. So you can wonder, you can see Antiochus, go, you know, what the heck is going on? You know, I put one, you put you in charge and now the city's being burned down. What What is going on? And from Antiochus's point of view, these are religious nut jobs causing the problem. What is he going to do? Well, we're going to just ban the things that indicate that you are that indicate that you are a member of this kind of religious extremist group. And I say religious extremist group because. Uh, you know, talking from the perspective of the Seleucids who just want a quiet, peaceful countryside where everybody can continue to purchase their Greek goods, where things can flow back and forth, where the tax collector can just work and get his money. He's not putting his finger on the pulse and understanding what's actually happening. 
So from his perspective, there's just some nut jobs running around, and we need to stamp them out. And in order to do that, we prevent them from doing the things that make them identify themselves and force them to become and accept this Greek culture that's allowing taxes and goods and stuff to flow back and forth in and around the countryside. So to enforce this new thing, and these are the laws that Antiochus implements, the banning of circumcision, punishable by death if you circumcise your child, the forcing of people to sacrifice pork on altars. These are some of the things that kind of make people Hellenistic Jewish people, the kind of hybrid between the two of them. These are some of the laws that Antiochus IV puts in place in order to end this religious discontent. Now, if you want to talk about somebody who's totally missed the target, who has no um, idea what is actually going on, this is like obviously somebody who's pouring gasoline on the fire and then throwing a powder keg on top of it and then some dynamite on top of that. And before he lights the match, he puts a governor, a guy by the name of Bacchides, in charge of going around to the countryside and enforcing these laws. Bacchides is the man who's going to light the match and set off this powder keg. So Bacchides, given royal decree by Antiochus to go around to the countryside and enforce these new laws, make sure we're weeding out who these crazy extremists are. We need a passive population in order to collect our taxes, in order to collect the goods and services and have things flowing through. We need to stamp this out. Be ruthless. Get it done. So back at ease. And I am now going to quote The Wars of the Jews by Flavius Josephus. And I may draw quite a bit. Oh, well, not may. I am going to be drawing quite a bit on this as we go along. So in The Wars of the Jews, quoting Flavius Josephus, talking about Bacchides and Antiochus IV, he compelled the Jews to dissolve the laws of their country and to keep their infants uncircumcised and to sacrifice swine's flesh upon the altar, against which they all opposed themselves and the most approved among them were put to death. Bacchides also, who was sent to keep the fortresses, having these wicked commands joined to his known natural barbarity, indulged all sorts of the extremest wickedness, and tormented the worthiest of the inhabitants, man by man, and threatened their city every day with open destruction, till at length he provided the poor sufferers by the extremity of his wicked doings to avenge themselves. This, of course, describes the governor Bacchides going around to the countryside, making sure, checking the people, the children, to make sure they weren't circumcised, and if they were, putting the women and parents to death, forcing the people to sacrifice pork on altars, as a symbol of their acceptance and compliance to the laws of Antiochus. He threatens the cities. You know, if you guys don't sacrifice pork, I'm going to level the city. It's as simple as that. It's A or B. There's no gray area. This is the situation. So you can imagine when this happens, you know, if somebody rolls up to your town and lines up your family, your women, your children in front of you and says, if you don't sacrifice pork on this altar, I'm going to slit the throats of your wife and children right in front of you. That's a tough decision you'd have to make. 
and you would imagine a great many people went and sacrificed pork on the altar. They went and kept their children uncircumcised and continued as much in secret to continue to practice their faith as best they could. And you can imagine amongst these groups of people, there were already what we would call these Hellenistic Jews who didn't care. Who said, yeah, well, they'll sacrifice pork on the altar. Well, it's just another thing. I'll go about and do that. They still followed all the other Jewish laws and customs. And when you think about that, there are Jews today who practice a lot of the Jewish faith and customs. Some of them will eat pork some of them will mix the cloth of their clothes. They'll eat dairy and meat together. You know, th there are differing levels of people who practice Jewish faiths who still consider themselves completely and unadulteratedly Jewish. And you would imagine that this existed in the countryside today, or pardon me, back then. And they didn't care if Bacchides came and said, yeah, sacrifice pork on the altar. Sure, no problem. I'm going to do that. And let me get back to business. But there are these other people who no doubt did it under great personal stress and then continued to practice their more orthodox beliefs in private. And then there were people who undoubtedly did not do that and so Bacchides slaughtered them. This is what was happening. And you can see this adding more gas to the fire to these um, outbreaks of violence that were already happening. There was already outbreaks of violence against these Hellenistic Jewish people. And in some cases, they may have been completely Greek colonies in farmsteads in and amongst the countryside that no doubt would have been a target as a kind of revenge after Bacchides or some of his followers and army people kind of went through the countryside. So you can see, despite their misguided intentions, this type of thing was not going to solve the problem and instead created the flashpoint for M Matthias and his sons. Because when Bacchides gets to the village of Modiin and he forces the Jewish people there to sacrifice pork on the altar or I'm going to slit your throats in front of your family, Matthias and his six sons instead attacked Bacchides and his guards and killed them instead. He'd had enough. Instead of attacking the countryside, the people that probably couldn't defend themselves and probably weren't really the root of the problem, but no doubt faced kind of the brunt of anger in order to kind of release some pressure you know, you, you can't attack the government. You can only attack this person here, which in your way, because they're following the rules of the government, represent the government, represent what's wrong with being Jewish. So Matthias and his sons attacked and killed Bacchidi and his guards rather than sacrifice pork on the altar rather than watch the village of Modi'in get destroyed. And Matthias and his sons, you know, you can imagine this being done in the heat of the moment and then standing around going, well, what the heck do we do now? We just killed the governor. There's a whole army that was just fighting the Romans just a few decades ago, there's a whole army that just slaughtered the Egyptian army just a few years ago. We're only six people. So Matthias and his sons 
run into the countryside to hide and hope that this whole thing blows over. Now this is where things get really interesting because now Modin and his sons, even though they're on the run, the story is told to us that people from Modin and the surrounding lands, instead of just kind of waiting in fear for the inevitable retribution to come their way, realize, well, win for a penny, we're in for a pound now. So the people go to Modin and his sons, or pardon me, go to Matthias and his sons and ask them to help raise an army and lead a rebellion. We're all dead anyways. We might as well fight back rather than just sit and wait for it to come. Now, Matthias, he was already an old man. He dies shortly afterwards, and he leaves his son, a guy by the name of Judas Maccabeus. This is where we get the Maccabean revolt from and the Maccabee family, Judas Maccabeus. He leaves Judas in charge with his brothers there to support him. Judas is, you know, facing off against the might of the Seleucid Empire, and he's got basically a few hundred people, men, women, children, wouldn't be really women, maybe in some cases, who knows, mostly men. He's got that to fight the entirety of the Seleucids. Now, there isn't a giant force of Seleucid people in the countryside. In fact, there's quite a small version of it. And Judas is pretty good, or at least he finds out that he's pretty good at fighting a guerrilla warfare. Judas is able to drive out the uh, governor of Jerusalem, Epiphanius, and retake the city, or at least take the city, because there's not really a Seleucid force there, in the name of his family. And their kind of ideals of what it means to be Jewish is now suddenly he's in a position to kind of enforce that, to reject the Seleucids, reject Bacchides, reject at the laws of Antiochus. So Judas is able with his family to cleanse then rededicate the temple. There's a citadel there kind of attached to the temple. It's not quite clear where it is or isn't, but he takes that. However, Antiochus has an army in According to the Wars of the Jews, it's 50,000 infantry, 5,000 cavalry, and about 50 elephants are sent into Judea to go and put down this revolt that's happened. Antiochus is getting serious. And Judas, you know, obviously he does not have an army that's 50,000 strong, pardon me, 55,000 strong, and he does not have any elephants. This is a guerrilla fighting force. These are not trained soldiers. But there is a famous battle. It's in a lot of medieval art, actually, the scene. Judas's brother, Eleazar, he charges an elephant, which he thinks Antiochus is on, charges through the Seleucid army and spears the elephant from beneath. The elephant falls on him and crushes him. Now, if you look up the, the uh, um, Eleazar Maccabee in medieval art, you will find a few uh, medieval arts that have no idea what an elephant looks like, because, of course, these are people that live in Europe, you know, Britain, France, 
all those places. They've never seen an elephant, so they're going off the description of what an elephant looks like in the uh, books of the Maccabees and the Wars of the Jews by Josephus, which would have been a book that a lot of early Christians or medieval Christians knew of, the nobility. So there, you can see a lot of weird drawings of people trying to figure out what an elephant looks like, and it looks pretty humorous. So look that up. You can see um, Eleazar Maccabee attacking Antiochus and his elephant, and you'll, you'll find some funny, uh, funny art from the medieval period about this. But Judas loses this battle, and Judas later tries to attack Antiochus at his camp, you know, this is more guerrilla tactics, not being successful in open warfare. And Judas is killed in this battle. And Judas's other brother, a guy by the name of John, is also killed in battle a few days later. So within a few days, three of the sons of uh, Matthias are dead. John, Eleazar, and the leader of the rebellion, Judas. The three remaining successors, Jonathan, Simon, and John Hyrcanus. Now, Jonathan and John are different people. So, so we'll have Jonathan and we have John. And I'm going to say John Hyrcanus for John. Jonathan is the most senior brother. He is declared kind of owner and rule, kind of ruler of the rebellion. He reaches out to Rome to try and get some kind of treaty in place. What that means is probably very little because it didn't really stop the Seleucids from continuing to try and attack the uh, Maccabees and their control over the region. But at least it's something on paper at which... Jonathan can point to that says even the great power of Rome recognizes our right to independence. Jonathan eventually makes peace with Antiochus by helping to support Antiochus, and this is now, I think, Antiochus the sixth, or at, who's a child. He makes a peace with him because a guy by the name of Trypho is the regent. And this regent, Trypho, tries to seize control of the Seleucid Empire. Trypho is able to capture and trick Jonathan. And this lets the other brother, Simon now, take over. He defeats Trypho in battle. Trypho has Jonathan killed in spite, so now we have Simon and John Hyrcanus are the last of the two sons of Matthias, still in that first generation of the revolt. Simon has a very successful uh, military campaign. He's got seasoned soldiers with him now. They've been fighting several battles. They've been able to collect a lot more quality gear. He captures a lot more cities, villages, expands the power base, captures garrison. Simon makes peace with Antiochus and the Seleucids and offers himself as a mercenary force to help take down Trypho. Pardon me, Trypho. Antiochus eventually betrays Simon, who tries to attack Judea, tries to get his lands back. However, Simon, in a set-piece battle, has a definitive battle against the Seleucids, and this is the battle which typically marks the beginning of Jerusalem independence with Simon Maccabee. Now we're at what I would call, what I like to call, the Game of Thrones period of the Maccabee family. Simon is now in charge. He's kind of had that set piece battle. Jerusalem is officially independent, and I say officially in quotes. 
because there is undoubtedly some agreement between the Ptolemies, or pardon me, with the Seleucids and with the Maccabee family and probably other people from the Sanhedrin, the ruling council in Jerusalem. There, as my previous guest, my an expert on the time period, Boris Krubasik put it, Jerusalem is in a state of um, quote-unquote vassalhood and not vassalhood between themselves and the Seleucids. There is clearly generational ties still in place that link important, powerful people within Jerusalem and the Judean countryside with the Ptolemy, or pardon me, with the Seleucids. And these people clearly still have political sway within Jerusalem. And Simon has not yet nailed down full control over the city, full control over the countryside. They're very clearly the Maccabees are an ascendant power. They hold the army. They're the high priests. They have a lot of political sway, but undoubtedly the Seleucids definitely still have their fingers in a lot of pies in Jerusalem. And the Maccabees still treat them with kid gloves. They don't just reject what they say. There is political um, fallout if they do not or if they have a disagreement of some severity with the Seleucids. Now, Simon has a son-in-law, Ptolemy, another Greek name. If you notice, there's this thing going on here. Ptolemy, the son-in-law of Simon, wants to be in charge. He does not want to wait for his father to die, so Ptolemy has Simon murdered, and he also sends assassins after the last son of Matthias, John Hyrcanus. Now the assassins fail. John um, returns to the city. He was away with the Seleucids fighting with a mercenary force. John Hyrcanus returns to Jerusalem him and Ptolemy are basically in a race to get to the city and kind of claim authority. If you're at all familiar with Roman history, when uh, whenever there was a kind of power struggle for who was going to be emperor of Rome, and there was an awful lot of that, the first person to get to Rome was typically the one who was the undoubtedly emperor. So there's a race between Ptolemy and John Hyrcanus for, and this is, they're from the same family. He's the, you know, the son-in-law of his brother. They're fighting for control over Jerusalem. Ptolemy is clearly has an army in his own right. Ptolemy takes John's mother and the rest of his family as prisoners they retreat to the city of Jericho, where John lays siege. Ptolemy eventually murders John's, bro or John's family and his mother. Now there is a break in the siege. And this is an interesting thing I learned about reading Josephus. There is what's called the um, um, restful year or the jubilee year, or it's also called the year of release. It's also, if you're uh, Hebrew speaking, I think it's called pronounced Schmidt, Schmitta. And my apologies, please, if I pronounce that wrong. If you're interested, the next Schmitta, the next year of release, falls on the Jewish year 5,789. Or if you're following the calendar everybody else in the world does, that's September 20, 2028. And what the year of release is, Every 50 years is what's called the Jubilee year or the year of release. It's kind of a big year-long um, thankfulness. Debts are forgiven. 
they, they don't sow lands, private land is made open, food is freely given throughout the city. Now this festival has not been marked in centuries. And you can't imagine you know, an entire group of people just taking a year off and still surviving today. But this was a thing that was happening. And during the civil war between John Hyrcanus and Ptolemy, it was this jubilee year. And John Hyrcanus lifted the siege for the year in order to honor this religious festival, this year-long religious festival. And Ptolemy escapes. Now Antiochus... This is Antiochus the Ninth, yet another Ptolemy, takes this year of release in the Civil War as an opportunity to regain lands lost by previous Seleucid rulers. Antiochus the Ninth lays siege to Jerusalem with Hyrcanus in it, and Hyrcanus has no choice. He opens up the tomb of King David and um, takes all the wealth out, what's totaling 3,000 talents, and bribes Antiochus the Ninth in order to break the siege. Now, this ticks off, of course, a lot of Jewish people. King David was obviously, uh, you know, a significant ruler, but again, you know, six of one, half dozen of another. You can stay free or you can go to, you know, the rule, pardon me, return to the rule of the Seleucids. Now John increases the lands under the Maccabee control again. He attacks Seleucid lands while Antiochus is off fighting Persia. This is when he takes Idumea, Marissa, and Samaria. And we talked quite a bit about Idumea and Marissa in my previous episode, if you're interested in what those places looked like. Listen to episode one in the series. John is looked upon, at least in the book of the Maccabees, very well. He was um, high priest. He had the gift of prophecy. John's sons are the ones who are laying siege to Samaria. And... The city of Jerusalem has a, what I would call a hate and hate relationship with Samaria. And there's no love in this relationship. John and his sons, they destroy Samaria. They siege it. And according to Josephus, and I'm going to quote here again, they pushed the siege so hard that a famine so far prevailed with the city that they were forced to eat what never was esteemed food. We'll just let that sink in for a moment. And if you're wondering what it's like to be in a city that's siege so long that you have to resort to eating things that aren't supposed to be food, that would be leather, wood, roots, cannibalism. You know, this is the experience of being in a siege at this time. And if you're at all interested in what that experience would be like, you can listen to episode one of my Destruction of the Tower of Babylon series where I talked about what the experience would have been like being within the city of Jerusalem when Nebuchadnezzar um, destroyed the city during his siege. This is the experience that Samaria felt. Famine, cannibalism. And John, Hyrcanus, and his sons, they destroy the city they enslave the inhabitants. They sell them in the Seleucid slave markets. And they, according to Josephus, continued laying waste to, quote, all the country that lay within Mount Carmel. 
And this triggered yet another civil war. This atro the atrocities visited amongst the Sumerians was so severe that it triggered yet another civil war within Judean lands, which John put down. Moving on into our what I would call what I'm calling the Game of Thrones period of the Maccabee family. After John Hyrcanus dies, he splits the rule of his kingdom up. Supposedly, John makes his wife the king, the ruler of Judea, and he makes his son Aristobulus the high priest. Aristobulus, of course, wants the power all for himself, is not happy to have be passed over and have his mother, of all people, become the ruler of the lands. So in true Game of Thrones fashion, Aristobulus seizes the throne. He has his mother and his brothers, except for Antigonus, who Aristobulus was very close with. He has all his other family members imprisoned, and he lets his mother starve to death in prison. That's pretty cold. So Aristobulus is able to seize power. He makes himself king and high priest. He's officially the first person to do this. And it's kind of informally happened previously. Josephus lists John Hyrcanus as king and high priest, as well as being a prophet. But Aristobulus is also kind of quoted by um, Josephus as being the first person to declare himself both king and high priest. Now Aristobulus and his brother, these were the guys who were laying waste to Samaria. They're competent generals. They're ruthless, but of course they're hardcore Orthodox Jewish people. They're following the Jewish and celebrating the Jewish Feast of Tabernacles. It's a seven-day festival, I believe. Again, uh, pardon my Hebrew if I'm getting it wrong. I believe it's pronounced Sukkot is the official name of the festival. But Aristobulus becomes sick during this Feast of Tabernacles. And at the same time, his brother Antigonus, who, again, they're very close together. Antigonus was returning from the conquest of Galilee, and he was wearing brand new armor. He had his honor guard with him. You know, you, you bring your best to the Festival of Tabernacles. He had just finished this up where... Aristobulus was sick and unable to take part in the festival. And Aristobulus' wife, Alexandra Salome, hatches a plot with other people within the uh, pardon me, court to seize control. And again, I love my Game of Thrones here. This, is, this book read way better than Game of Thrones. What Alexandra Salome does... She begins with other people within the court to play Aristobulus off his brother Antigonus. Because Aristobulus is sick and unable to take part in kind of officially ruling the lands, he's forced to rely on Antigonus to launch military campaigns. He's forced to rely on his wife and his court to kind of do the everyday running of the court. So you can imagine a sick king kind of sequestered away relying on the words of people who are actively working against him and making choices based on that having no direct interaction with people and his brother Antigonus who's away in battle coming back with the army and Alexandra Salome who's been kind of running the kingdom with Aristobulus being sick as a puppet king, probably worrying that Antigonus is going to find out what's going on and that'll be the end of her. Another woman stuffed in a prison and maybe starved to death. 
And so she hatches a plot against Antigonus as he arrives for the Feast of the Tabernacles. She's been playing Aristobulus off Antigonus, claiming that Antigonus, who's tired of his bro- being in the shadow of his brother, coming back with the army to seize the control of the city and the lands, Aristobulus orders himself to be shut up inside the fortress in the city and then orders that Antigonus come to him unarmed to answer for these crimes that have been charged against him. But of course he's sick, relying on his wife, relying on court intermediaries to reach out to Antigonus. And so we're told Alexandra Salome switches the official order, and what gets to Antigonus is not arrive and answer for the charges of these treasonous crimes that have been brought against you. It's come to the fortress with your guards in your brand new armor and show me all the wealth that you've acquired in your conquest of Galilee. So Antigonus, who left for the conquest of Galilee knowing or you know him and his brother were in great terms and you know working well together says well great my brother wants to celebrate me so he shows up at the citadel in full armor with his honor guard wearing their weapons to show off to his brother what they acquired from the conquest of galilee and when he shows up the guards seeing him armed slaughter him because they a are either in on the plot and have an excuse to murder antigonus or they weren't in on the plot but aristobulus had ordered that if he showed up with weapons to kill him so that he doesn't take the throne so that's a uh, rock in a hard place um, scenario for antigonus Aristobulus only gets more sick with proper part pardon me partly guilt partly the sickness that has been deteriorating his health he's vomiting blood he supposedly dies on the very same spot his brother was killed in the fortress but Alexandra Salome with Aristobulus out of the way and Antigonus out of the way Freeze the other children of John Hyrcanus, names, she names Alexander's uh, Yanias, the king, who's a son of John Hyrcanus, and she marries him. You can see Alexandra Salome is a ruthless woman who's able to um, manipulate both Aristobulus manipulate the court and the court are responding to her as an authority figure you know traditionally if you listen to my last episode we talked about the roles of women that we found out the higher up you were in the society of Jerusalem the less rights and freedom you had as a woman and yet Alexandra Salome is able to uh, manipulate and work with the court to not only become the puppet ruler of Aristobulus, but she names Aristobulus's heir. It's not the court that does that. And then she marries the heir. She marries Alexander Yanias. So even though the story, as we're told in Josephus, is Alexander Yanias is the one who conquers the lands of Judea and expands it to the largest it would ever be, In my head, I'm wondering, is Alexander Yanias just another puppet king? Another one doing what Alexander Salome is wanting to be done. She made him king. She destroyed her brothers. This is a formidable woman who will actually become queen after Alexander Yanias dies. Before Alexander Yanias dies, before Alexandra Salome becomes sole ruler, Alexander Yanias embarks on um, conquering Egyptian lands, 
So he conquers a huge chunk of the Levant region, southern, kind of closest to Egypt. The lands of Judea expand to as large as they're going to be. But Alexander Yanias triggers yet another civil war. The Jewish rebel, pardon me, rebels go to the Seleucids for assistance, which Alexander is only able to put down through the use of outside mercenaries. So this is yet another civil war. And Alexander Yanias undergoes another civil war following this one after he has a failed invasion of Arabia. Alexander Yanias loses his entire army to the Arabian king and this triggers yet another internal civil war against Alexander Yanias who again has to put down internally through the use of mercenaries. According to Josephus, Alexander has to kill, quoting Josephus, not fewer than 50,000 of the Jews in the interval of six years. A six-year-long civil war is going on under the rulership of Alexander Yanias, and he only gains peace through atrocities against his own people. Quoting Josephus again, For when he had ordered 800 to be hung upon crosses in the midst of the city, he had their throats of their wives and children cut before their eyes. And these executions he saw as he was drinking and laying down with his concubines. Upon which so deep a surprise seized on the people that 8,000 of his opposers fled away the very next night out of all of Judea whose flight was only terminated by Alexander's death. Just to let that sink in here, Alexander Unias is sitting down with a bunch of his concubines, eating food, drinking, laying out on a couch as he watches 800 of his rebels that he's captured being crucified and watching the wives and children of those people, watching their throats be cut right in front of those crucified people. And he's sitting there drinking some wine, eating some food, and lazing around with his concubines. This is somebody who's beyond hardcore. This is what we would call biblical. This is right up there with the atrocities of Syrians and Babylonian kings. So you can understand Alexander Unias is not very well loved by um, Judean people. Now he did gain peace. He did put down the civil war. And he does die. And when he does die, he leaves his kingdom to his wife, not to his children. His wife, Alexandra Salome, the one who was able to run Aristobulus as a puppet king and played Aristobulus off his brother Antigonus, had them kill each other. The one who named Alexander Unias as king and then married him. And now as Alexander Unias dies, she's left in sole charge and she rules competently she increases the army she increases the land she builds uh, you know the borders up creates security for the people she reconciles with uh, the group called the pharisees who have been persecuted under um, alexander unias now when alexandra dies her two sons Aristobulus II and John Hyrcanus II. Both of them have two civil wars against each other, trying to gain control over the throne of Judea. And these civil wars are only ended with Roman intervention. We are now at the time of Julius Caesar, Pompey, the Triumvirate, and the civil war between Caesar and Pompey. And during this war, 
Pompey is in Syria. He defeats and conquers Syria, and he gets control over uh, the lands of Judea, and he kind of ends the dispute between these two brothers. And he appoints Hyrcanus II as the ruler because he believes him to be weaker and easier to control. Now, this doesn't actually end pretty. You know, Pompey doesn't just show up and say, well, it's over, and I'm going to put Hyrcanus in charge. Aristobulus tries to fight Pompey and seal himself up inside, first the city of Jerusalem, which Pompey promptly sieges and captures. Aristobulus retreats into the temple and the fortress surrounding the temple, and he forces Pompey to besiege the temple. Let me say that again. He forces Pompey to besiege the temple in Jerusalem, which Pompey doesn't destroy, but he certainly severely damages and captures, takes it by force, and while Pompey is there, he defiles the sanctuary by going into the holiest of holies, which only the high priest is able to do in order to see what was there. Now, just a few years after this, during the um, civil war between Caesar and Pompey, Mark Antony, Julius Caesar's right-hand man, best bud, Mark Antony is in the area tracking down Pompey, and Mark Antony gets involved in what is potentially another Roman, um, or pardon me, potentially another Maccabean play for control over Judea. And Mark Antony is convinced by Herod to put himself in charge as the ethnarch and ruler of Judea on behalf of Rome. Herod the first not Herod the first yet. Well, now Herod the first, I guess you could say. Herod had already been working studiously for Rome for the previous um, 15 years or so, or 10 years or so, dutifully collecting taxes in Syria and in Samaria. Herod is an Idumean. He was born there. Herod marries into the Maccabee family and solidifies his rule over Judea, becoming uh, what's known as Herod the Great, and I'm going to get into this period in uh, next uh, next episode. But we're going to end here with the establishment of Herod and the end of the Maccabean dynasty. Now we've just gone through about 180 years of the history of Judea, the city of Jerusalem, the Seleucids, Rome. And I hope you've found some of the characters, the historical people of the Hasmonean dynasty as fascinating as I have. From uh, Matthias, the father who triggered the Maccabean revolt, to Judas Maccabeus, who led the initial guerrilla warfare, built the army that his brother would take over his brother Simon who would kind of solidify Judean independence then we get into what I call the Game of Thrones period which is John Hyrcanus and his heirs Aristobulus and um, Antigonus Alexandra Salome who throughout this Game of Thrones cutthroat wars for who is going to be the king and head of the Maccabean family, the high priest and king of Jerusalem. Alexandra Salome shows her political chops at playing Aristobulus and Antigonus off each other, who gets to have these two people who seize the throne, gets them to murder each other, gets them to to die she seizes power she's the king maker of alexander unias and after alexander unias cripples jerusalem and judea in the civil war and yet at the same time 
builds the army and lands of Judea as the biggest kingdom it will ever become, and then leaves it all to Alexander Salome, who's able to solidify Judean control and security for her heirs, Hyrcanus and Aristobulus II, who have yet another civil war against each other before Rome steps in and seizes control and flexes their authority over the region. Now, what I didn't talk about was what was happening in the background, because I did talk quite a bit about that with uh, Professor Boris Krubasik in my previous episode, is that there are these religious groups trying to, at the same time, negotiate and figure out what it means to be Jewish. These groups called the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the Essenes, the Zealots. What do these groups mean? Do they mean anything? But we know they're in the background. We know that they're even internally within the Maccabee family. There are Maccabee um, kings who are at times persecuting one group while at the same time forcing the other to be ascendant. Some of the civil wars, especially under Alexander Yanias, we know there was explicitly persecution of at least one of these groups, the Pharisees, of which Alexander Salome makes peace with. We know also the community at Qumran, which is where the famous Dead Sea Scrolls are from. This group at this pot time during this period breaks off, breaks away from the Maccabee family, from Jerusalem, from the high priest and their authority, and starts their own community and religious group there independent of Jerusalem. So there is a religious tension happening even all through this period, even as the Maccabee family themselves are vying for control, who's going to be in charge, there is this thing happening in the background of one group becoming ascendant philosophically with what it means to be Jewish, pushing other groups to the side. Now, who who is what? Is, you know, is somebody this group versus this group? That's not necessarily what's important. What's important to understand is that it is happening in the background. Sometimes it is violent. Sometimes it is one of the causes of civil wars, even amongst the Maccabee family or between Maccabee kings and the Judean countryside. Sometimes it's atrocities that trigger civil wars, but this is clearly not a peaceful period. Now, I don't know if you've been keeping track in the background here, but this is 10 separate civil wars, according to my math, in about a 100-year period, give or take. Let me say that again. This is about 10 civil wars in about a 100-year period. Now, 100 years, you know, that's what, four generations, give or take? Ten civil wars in four generations. This is what's been rocking the Judean countryside. This civil war is not only for religious, what it means to be Jewish from a religious perspective, but also there is the rejection of Greek culture, Greek material, Greek silverware, pottery, the wa the Greek wine that some of these people loved at the start of my discussion here. By the time of Herod II, there's a lot less of that in the countryside. This is the time that we're coming to as we get to the rule of Herod the Great, the Jesus of Nazareth, his movement, and what will become the tinderbox for the first Jewish-Roman revolt. Stay tuned for this in our next episode. Thank you for listening. This has been an episode of The Grim Dark History. Mm -hmm.